telling them who you are, why you are, what you are. You're the star in the spotlight. 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 Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ryan Keating. We have always prided ourselves over the diversity of our guests, and today's interview is certainly no exception to that rule. This former Miss Nebraska has made Broadway appearances in Kiss Me Kate, Kismet in the Pajama Game, among others. She recently finished an acclaimed engagement at Michael's Pub singing the songs of Stephen Sondheim. In a moment, we'll be talking to Julie Wilson. Julie, welcome. This is a pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, you've done several of Stephen Sondheim's musicals in the past, and you said, unlike Cole Porter, he makes the singer do the work. Well, I think he makes the audience do the work, because they have to listen mm -hmm. very hard to get all his lyrics. He really demands a lot from his audience. He makes you really dial in and listen. He, it's not, nothing is glib, nothing is wasted mm -hmm. with Sondheim. It's not... Uh, just glossed over. You know, everything he says is, you know, has a meaning. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't fool around. <laughs> How do you find his material in comparison with Cole Porter? Well, I find him very, very deep and very emotional mm -hmm. and very today and very uh, of the moment. I've always felt Sondheim was ahead of his, ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cole Porter is like a wonderful big romantic bubble. <laughs> Very romantic, very glamorous, very frothy, and uh, uh, like uh, the beginning stages of a mad love affair. Mm -hmm. Well, you wouldn't think being a corn-fed girl from Nebraska, as uh, the papers like to call you, that you would be in New York singing frothy, bubbly, madcaps. Oh, uh, well, uh, I've been at it a long time. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I must say, uh, I, I have always been fascinated by lyrics from the time I was a very little girl. Lyrics and the story mm -hmm. was always most important to me. Well, you'd started out as a band singer at Benson High, if I'm not mistaken. I started out uh, working with high school bands and college bands while I was a Benson student. Mm -hmm. And I sang in the church choir, I sang in the Benson High musical reviews, I sang in the, in the uh, musical contests. And my, big, my big time in Omaha was my big trip to Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> and I think I was outrageous. I took my first smoke, tried my first <laughs> cigarette, and didn't like it, and never smoked from that moment on. Well, I'm sure back then it was like the uh, Virginia Slims. <laughs> Well, I'll you tell you, it was, uh, it was a great experience. You know, I, I had wonderful times at Benson High School. I treasure all those memories. They were mm -hmm. great days. How supportive were your parents of your singing? Because you left home right after high school. And yes, I did. I was in my first semester at Omaha University, majoring in drama, mm -hmm. minoring in music. And uh, they, they didn't pay much attention. They said, well, if she's happy, if that's what she likes, you know. It's her life, it's her choice. Do you think in retrospect it was hard for them because certainly then as opposed to now it was girls seemed to get married right after high school and they didn't leave the home so readily? Well, I asked my mother a few years ago. I said, Mom, I said, that took a lot of courage for you to let me go flying out of Omaha, Nebraska at the age of 18 was a touring mm -hmm. tour of Earl Carroll's vanities. Mm -hmm. And how, how did you let me go? How, what gave you the courage to let me go? And not to fight or not to say I shouldn't or to uh, rain on my parade, so to speak. And my mom merely said, well, she said, I knew it was very important to you. She said, if I had tried to stop you from your opportunity, your chance, she said, you may have thrown it in my face the rest of my life as being the person that stopped your chance. Mm -hmm. So she said, I didn't want to do that. 
I didn't want to take that chance. So she said, I just had to let you go. She said it was hard. I think that's probably the greatest love of all, really, when you think about it. Truly. That. Letting go is hard. I'm sure it was hard. Well, your children are coming of age now as well. And yes. how do you find that? Well, uh, I think because of my mother's um, understanding and letting me be free uh, to do what was in my heart, uh, it has uh, made it very clear to me that uh, in order to uh, let someone be happy, they have to make their own choices. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't dream of trying to make a choice for either of my sons. They have to find their own way and do what's important to them the same as I did. Mm -hmm. If they ask me a question and want an honest answer, I'll give them an on honest answer the way I feel about it, my opinion, but my opinion is only my opinion. Um, but I would never try to stop them from doing anything that was important to them. The same as I appreciated my mother not stopping me. Well, your mother seemed to have been very supportive of your career always since she went to London with you when you... Well, that was fun. I mean, I invited her because I enjoyed her company so much and because I missed her so much. And I, uh, I worked all the time. So uh, I solemnly had a week free. And uh, when I did, you know, I usually did run home, even if it was for four or five days, mm -hmm. see everybody. But uh, when I took her to London, you know, we could spend four or five, six months, you know, while I was doing a show or something. So we really had a pretty neat time. And uh, we traveled and had a vacation in uh, Italy, Venice, Milano, Rome, Florence, Paris, southern France. We, we, we enjoyed a lot of visits together. Canada, San Francisco, Chicago. We, we had a good time. When you had gotten out of or left the University of, at Omaha, did you, uh, you were traveling with bands? No, as I was traveling with Earl Carroll Vanities. I never really traveled with any band except Johnny Long. Right. And I was given that job uh, in 1944. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, he fired me on the road mm -hmm. on Christmas. I thought I'd die. But um, it's a strange thing. One can either be totally crushed by a disappointment or a quote unquote a kick in the pants, um, or one can have a certain uh, retaliation, uh, a promise to oneself to say, aha. Uh -huh, they don't think I'm good enough. Mm -hmm. So which they approach did you take? They fired me, <laughs> so I'm going to show them. That was my approach, mm -hmm. that they were wrong. And it's very dear because uh, we remained friends all, over all the years. And Johnny Long uh, came to see me, and the Mater D did not tell me. This is at the Rainbow Grill in New York 12 or 13 years ago. And the maitre d' was a very nice guy called Benji. And he said, Miss Wilson, I have a big surprise for you tonight. He said, a very old good friend of yours is there to watch you perform. And he said, I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm going to let you be surprised. And I walked out to do my first show, and there sat Johnny Bob. I mean, it was a thrill that he did come. And at that point in my life, I used the name Mary Lou. Mm -hmm which I had chosen as a little kid because of the song, Mary Lou, I love you, cross my heart, yes I do. So when I went to kindergarten, they said, what's your name? And instead of saying my, my real baptized name, which was Julia Mary Wilson, I said, Mary Lou. So my mother was very easygoing. She said, if she wants to be Mary Lou, let her be Mary Lou. So when I started with Johnny Long, I was still using Mary Lou, which was the name I used in high school. So he, he just grinned from ear to ear and he said, Mary Lou, he said, you sure did show us, didn't you? He said, you're terrific. He was very sweet. Very sweet. You had met a Baron Poland who was very influential on your career. Baron Poland. Poland. Baron in Poland. Miami. 
Yes, that's true. He, uh, he saw my closing night, as fate would have it, at a tiny little um, saloon restaurant called Mother Kelly's. <laughs> and boy, did I get a workout at that place. It sounds weird. One of, one of uh, the, the comic at this establishment was a very funny man called Gene Bayless. A very funny comic. And uh, they had a trio, Frank Sorrell's trio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must say, it was a marvelous experience. And uh, I worked very hard and did five shows a night. Seven nights a week. And the job lasted for about seven or eight months. And then I thought, it's time that I moved on. But it really taught me a lot. It really did. It was a great experience. A great experience. I, did. I never regret any of the things I've done. I just regret the things <laughs> I didn't do. Well, uh, you had, um, he had gotten you a screen test in Hollywood. Yes, he did. He arranged a screen test with uh, the very uh, fabulous character and the renowned Sam Goldwyn, mm -hmm. Samuel Goldwyn. And that was, uh, that was quite an experience. I walked into Mr. Goldwyn's office and uh, I was dressed in Baron Poland's beautiful sister's clothing, <laughs> borrowed earrings and the secretary outside Mr. Uh, Goldwyn's office said, bust and bury earrings. Mr. Goldwyn doesn't like earrings, so, so I took here. No, I forgot them today. So uh, I walked in and I had my hair all piled on top of my head. The up hairdo was kind of a mm -hmm. thing at that time. And I had some false curls that I'd stuck up there. I wasn't too good at doing my own hair, but I did the best I could. I had no money to go to a fancy hairdresser. So he just looked at me and he said, is that your own hair? And I said, well, part of it. <laughs> he said, well, would you mind taking it off? That's not yours. And combing it down so I can see what you really look like. So, yeah, that was an experience. Personally, I was kind of humiliated, mm -hmm. very embarrassed. But I did as he wished. But, but then he looked at me and he said, you can you can leave, you know, and so I left. I mean, it was a very, sh very short interview. Mm -hmm. P.S. I did the test. They didn't keep me. <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was a good experience. Well, then you had gotten booked into the Macambo. Yes, that, that was a lucky uh, happening. Uh, there was a, a radio show called the Hollywood Showcase. And Mickey Rooney was the host. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there was a panel of judges, and whomever was chosen by, they, they voted, the judges voted, or whatever performer, and we all, you know, did something, be it a tap dance, or, uh, uh, play an instrument, sing a song, whatever. I happened to be the singer that day. And, uh, and, the, and the reward, uh, it won, one was to have an engagement at the famous Macambo uh, nightclub. It's all kind of a promotion thing. So, yes, yours truly was the winner. I even had a date with Mickey Rooney. Well, how did you find that experience? gorgeous skin. She looked like a movie star. And she had the loveliest clothes. Her name was Mary, Mary Morrison. And when I met Mary at the rehearsal hall, she said, I have the most divine dressmaker in the world. He is a brilliant designer. And his workmanship is unequal. 
Shudra. So she took me to meet him, and he liked me. I liked him very much. He was a very warm, dear man. And uh, she asked him, as a special favor, uh, would he make a gown at a reasonable price for me, and then I could pay it out uh, as I as I wanted. Mm -hmm. And he did. He was very kind. George Carr was the gentleman's name, and he made me subsequently made all my gowns for years. And uh, he he was and is a creative, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, well, it's been said that you're a girl who likes to work on your feet, and uh, one report had it that so you could get your tax deduction, uh, your gowns were made so tight that you couldn't sit down. Well, uh, that that is true. I mean, uh, the the gowns are molded, mm -hmm. uh, are prepared, you know, just for standing. Um, I uh, I'm not a singer that sits on a stool. Right. During the act, no. I've always just preferred to stand at the mic and do my thing. Mm -hmm. We must pause for a commercial break. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be back in a moment with Julie Wilson. Julie, you had started in New York as a Copa girl and at the Latin Quarter. First, I was a Latin Quarter lovely, <laughs> and then I was a Copa girl. Did you find it hard getting established as a performer in New York? or? Not really. I was very lucky. Um, I had uh, left Earl Carroll Vanities, the tour that came to New York. I gave my two-week notice. I was very brave because mm -hmm. I didn't have two cents. But I did not want to go back to California or to continue on with the show, with the tour. And uh, I found New York very exciting. And Wonderful. All those big tall buildings and everything. I thought it was terrific. Yeah. It really was exciting. So I decided that I would stay in New York. And uh, one gentleman that I met backstage at the Low State Theater, where we were playing mm -hmm. the Vanities, was a very nice uh, insurance salesman. And he had uh, a friend who worked. It's a Latin Quarter, a dancer. And he said, well, maybe I can help you. Maybe uh, maybe I can introduce you to uh, the manager there, Wally Wanger, who, you know, is in charge of hiring the, mm -hmm. the girls. And he said, who knows, you might get a job. So I, I went over to see him. He said, well, he said, I don't need anybody here right now. He said, but I'm putting together a, a Latin Quarter show for the famous Latin Quarter in Chicago on Randolph Street. Would you be interested in going to Chicago and singing the production numbers? I thought that was pretty terrific. You know, and the salary was like double mm -hmm. the Earl Carroll Vanity's salary. So. Uh, golly, if I could make $75 a week, I mean, wow, you know, that was a lot of money. So I said yes. I even got a job for one of my friends who, uh, who was also in the Earl Carroll Vanities. I asked him. He said, well, uh, does she sing? I said, no. And he said, does she dance? And I said, well, <laughs> I said, but she's beautiful <laughs> and has a great figure and gorgeous eyes and everybody loves her. So he gave her a job also. So uh, even though it wasn't in New York, uh, we did have a good run in Chicago mm -hmm. and Detroit. And then I decided maybe I should go home and go back to school. And I did go back for six months. But uh, the, the pull was strong. Mm -hmm. And I realized I kind of made a mistake by trying to go back to school. And I just really wanted to get on with the business. Well, do you think when you're a performer in education, a formal college education, is that necessary? 
or do you think it's just something where you can put your career on hold for four years? I think it's a marvelous thing to have because I think it gives one personal satisfaction and a sense of achievement and a sense of security. Uh, what one learns, one can never take away, mm -hmm. good or bad. Uh, I, I wish that I had uh, finished my school. I mean, not to the point of getting a master's degree or a doctor or anything, uh, but I, I would like to have had a, a Bachelor of Arts. I really would have. But as things worked out, uh, I, I decided to go back in the business and I called up my one connection, Mr. Wanger, who was the manager of the shows at the uh, Latin Quarter, and he said, well, I'll, I didn't have any money, and my parents didn't. And he said, I'll send you the money and I have a job. So he was very kind. And uh, so I went back to New York and started working at the Latin Quarter. It was seven nights a week, a tough job. Two shows a night, and uh, they were long shows. And it was 50 bucks, which mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of money. Particularly after I'd been spoiled and I'd gotten <laughs> 75. But uh, from there, I went to the, lab, to, uh, the Copa. And from the Copa, I went to John Allen's band. So I, I was really lucky. And I loved having had that marvelous experience of being in New York when there were eight, nine, 10, 12, 15, 20 different nightclubs when it was, everything was popping and everything was going all night until four in the morning. And, you know, it was, there was an excitement. You almost believed that song, the, the uh, uh, come on and listen to the, the you know, the- uh, Lullaby. The Robert. lullaby. Of Robert. I mean, it, it, everything had that spirit. Uh -huh. Uh, the Lindy's and, and uh, Rubens and the open all night and the people would go in and have a huge breakfast at five in the morning. Then I'd get on the subway and go home for, on my little nickel. That was it. Subways were a nickel. I mean, it was a very World different times time. Have and I wasn't afraid either. It wasn't considered dangerous. I just did it. I didn't even think about it. How do you find coming back to New York today? Do you find it hard to accept that change? Well, I guess I've been a part of New York for so long, and it has changed gradually, and I've just accepted it. It's part of the city, but it's, it's not just New York. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Everything's changed. Every city. Omaha isn't the quiet, uh, safe, uh, crime-free city that it was once cracked up to be. Uh, it's a different world now. The values are different. People want more. They know more. They see more. Television has opened a whole vast horizon to a lot of people that would never have had an opportunity mm -hmm. to have known and to have seen all these many things ways of lives. It's, uh, television has made a very sophisticated world. Do you think because of that there's more pressure on the young who are trying to make it and now an education seems to be you have to go to graduate school if you want to get any place? I think it's harder. I think truly it, uh, the competition is tougher. I think uh, uh, there are fewer jobs. Everything's computerized, and that's cut out a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think there is more pressure. And of course, the atomic age that we're in, so, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, restless world. And there are many, many problems, and there always will be. There always have been. 
but I think a person just has to do the best they can, hang in there, and uh, see what happens. Just go with it. Just you know, you do what you want to do with your life and do the best you can. Well, like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, the, the world didn't offer us any uh, rose garden. You know, uh, I, th I think some people feel that they should be handed things. But I don't think the world is that way. I think you have to go out and work damn hard for what you want. And uh, there has to be discipline and self-evaluation and uh, you have to give up things for what you want sometimes I mean there's you get nothing for nothing you know to be a success is hard work it takes a lot of time a lot of energy I think the, the greatest blessing anyone can have is uh, having good health so that they can function and do and work hard and have a lot of energy Energy is a very important factor. You can't go too far without energy. Well, you've been certainly a testament to the fact that discipline does bring its rewards. And our time is up. I do appreciate your... So soon. So soon. I appreciate your stopping by today. Thank you. I had a lovely visit with you. This is Ryan Keating, and you've been watching Spotlight with guest Julie Wilson. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can write to myself in care of Perot Productions, 640 10th Avenue. New York, New York, 10036. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating for Spotlight. Thank you. Okay.